So this is the beginning of the Satipatthana Sutta. This is uh, Majjhima Nikaya 10. So I have heard, at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Kurus near the Kuru town named Kama Sadhamma. There the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, Bhante, they replied. The Buddha said this, Bhikkhus, this is the path that leads squarely to the purification of beings, to getting past sorrow and lamentation, to make an end of suffering and upset, to accomplishing the method and to realizing Nibbana, namely the four establishments of recollection. What for? Here, a bhikkhu abides maintaining perspective of the body concurrently with the body, diligent, aware, and recollected, having dispelled longing and upset in regard to the world. He abides maintaining perspective of feelings concurrently with feelings, diligent, aware, and recollected, having dispelled longing and upset in regard to the world. He abides maintaining perspective of the mind concurrently with the mind, diligent, aware, and recollected, having dispelled longing and upset in regard to the world. He abides maintaining perspective of phenomena concurrently with phenomena, diligent, aware, and recollected, having dispelled longing and upset in regard to the world. So how do you practice that uh, concretely? Any ideas? I would have to start by understanding the concurrency, that is a common thread with uh, all the four establishments of recollection. Mm. And perhaps we can yeah. clear up from the outset that um, virtue and sense restraint are already prerequisites. It doesn't hold to mention that again. So assuming that that is understood, then one needs to understand that uh, concurrent attention as a as a principle that all these satipatthana have in common. Mm. Yeah. yeah, because I think I mentioned in one of the previous ones that uh, it's easy for people to think of satipatthana as absorption or focusing because they overemphasize the body. Mm. But it's talking there about these four aspects and and feelings. Like it says, if you read further, it says. Um, because feelings then in the same along the same lines feelings are interpreted as sensations but if you look further in the sutta it says you have feelings of the flesh feelings not of the flesh hmm. so that right from the outset uh, disqualifies the interpretation of feelings as sensations which means like if you have something that's not of the flesh something that's not like in your knees or in your back or, or in your belly uh, by definition that's not something you'll be able to focus on hmm. And as it says there, it's, uh, well, as I translate it, it's uh, maintaining perspective. Um, so we could maybe ask, uh, why does it say there that these four foundations of recollection would help you to transcend suffering and transcend sorrow, lamentation, and, uh, you know, overcoming upset and longing in regard to the world? If it's not focused, because of course mm -hmm. you you uh, you will overcome uh, longing and and all states by just replacing what you perceive with something else. Mm. Uh, like you you kind of uh, fix the mess that you have in the room by not being there to begin with. You just go to another room and then you don't have to see what what's there. Yeah, but, but which means that fundamentally you don't really fix it. Exactly, you're yeah, just yeah. sticking your head in the sand. Basically. Yeah, yeah, but so if. So if it's not that, then how does this actually help to to transcend suffering? Yeah, so how does maintaining perspective in these four distinct ways mm. end sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair? Mm. That's the question, right? Yeah. Well, so that's that kind of, I mean, I guess, little insert before we really delve into that question. Um, 
because it talks about these four establishments and it says um, having put aside um, was it longing and despair um, so that it kind of the way I read that is it, it kind of says that have like the putting that aside is almost your gateway into this mm. practice yeah because always in the suttas um, there's many suttas that say that practice of mindfulness is preceded by sense restraint and sense restraint as defined is exactly the same uh, term in Pali that talks about uh, longing and upset like not grasping signs and features means that you won't be overcome with longing and upset regarding the objects of the six senses mm-hmm. and that's like the prerequisite for Satipatthana mm-hmm. it's not the result of Satipatthana so in other words you, you, you need to already not be doing this as a form of management because you have dealt with the coarse longing and upset beforehand through sense restraint. So mm-hmm. not you're not doing if you skip that aspect then automatically this will just become a way of like how do I replace this or get rid of it as quickly as possible. And then you're not really maintaining perspective. You're kind of just replacing one thing with another, but the perspective remains equally muddled. Hmm. Yeah. So that's a lot of people might go into this practice looking for the way out of longing and upset, but mm-hmm. actually overcoming lo- longing and upset to some degree is kind of your, that's that's the work that needs to be done before yeah, you can yeah, even yeah. really think about Satipatthana's yeah, part yeah, of the work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I think, Samyutta Nikaya 46.6, we can put it in the description, that talks about how, yes, uh, mindfulness is preceded by sense restraint. When you already established in sense restraint, then mm. you can practice the four Siddhipatthanas. But so having having said that then, how does that um, cement and, and fully uh, yeah, establish your mind in freedom from any kind of suffering? Mm. Or you could ask it the other way. How does not having mindfulness make you suffer? So what's what's longing and upset? What's uh, what is sorrow? Is it just objects that come to you? Mm, it's more like um, my attitude toward this object. Mm. And more specifically, like based on what attitude would there be? sorrow and despair and so on or a craving i'm craving for things to be not the way it is mm. Mm. just wanting things to be different and it doesn't say destroying longing and upset it's mm. more um kind of those not continually acting out of these tendencies mm. um, so that's like that's not to say there won't still be inclinations towards old habits but it's it's not just like oh you know i I still sometimes like have the thought that i should whatever smoke a cigarette like oh that means i haven't kind of i haven't gotten it yet you know maybe Mm -hmm. a few more years that'll eventually kind of wear out i've noticed over the past few years you know you get into that kind of stuff but it's like the the setting it down is something you should be able to do immediately Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you you look at the description of mindfulness of the mind, and it doesn't say he doesn't have passion, he doesn't have aversion. It says when it when it's there, he knows it as such, and in itself, that's an establishment of perspective. Hmm. Because so what I, what I was trying to get at is yeah, so it's the craving that makes these objects a problem, which means that if you yes, if you replace the objects. The craving won't be there because, like, the push for the craving is not there anymore. But that doesn't mean you're not liable to the craving. So then if you, instead of going at that route, you realize it's through lack of perspective that craving comes to be. It's not through just in, in itself kind of 
this comes to me or something it's immediately when you don't have perspective you act out on some level even if you have you're established in sense restraint and so on um you, you so longing and upset like you're not acting out of it anymore but the the perversion of of perception you could say or the perversion of the wrong order of seeing things is still there so the feeling that you might be having for example we could take that example as so as to sort of um illustrate the principle in a way that people are probably not familiar with because it's usually the body that's that's emphasized mm. as i just said so let's say you have a unpleasant feeling that's enduring right now so you're established in virtue you're not acting out of it but um if you're not aware that there is an unpleasant feeling enduring for me right now as the sutta says automatically you will be on some level inclining towards either getting rid of it or or indulging in it whatever it wants you to do you you sort of at least welcome that direction even if you're not doing it uh, physically or verbally so when you see actually not just how do i get rid of this but no there is a feeling unpleasant feeling enduring in this experience and i maintain perspective of that that perspective in itself prevents you from acting out of it but you need to to some extent that's why the so to say uh, faith needs to come first faith is a fact as a faculty it even comes before mindfulness or before recollection because um if you haven't taken it on faith that that is the middle way mm. that it is just this maintaining a, a perspective that will truly uproot the underlying tendency to craving then your mind will convince you like no 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 i have to deal with it i have to do something about yeah, it yeah you you will be going with your old habit yeah. which is trying to deal with its feelings yeah can, can we say like just to see if i understood what you say like so the feeling is there regardless we like it or not mm. but ignorance in regard to it it's something that we actively engage with that direction of ignoring that feeling you have a say in it yeah well we have a say in it but it's if we don't see this feeling It's because we ourselves engage in that direction of ignorance. Yeah, ignorance. yeah, yeah. So the the more you act out, then the the harder it becomes to recognize it. The the more the ignorance increases. Uh, but that's why then it says uh, in the Paritisamupada dependent origination uh, formula or or series of st steps. It says with ignorance, there is activity, there is acting out. Obviously of the wrong kind, not like just mm -hmm. anything in general. It's it, all it takes for these unwholesome things to be there is not seeing and and not seeing in this proper sense of this. You could say it's like um, lack of clarity of these general aspects of your experience makes you um, descend onto the particulars of the experience. So descending onto particulars is what unwholesomeness is mm -hmm. in and of itself. Like yeah. even if it's like the right ideas about Dhamma or or something like that the fact that you are just absorbed in that and you don't see the more general uh, component of that experience then and there i mean you will be acting out of craving yeah and so since as and since being with the particulars is the problem there then body as a satipatthana cannot be a particular mm. feeling as a satipatthana cannot be a particular sensation Mood. mind as a particular or mood cannot be random thoughts that you happen to have and dhamma as a as general phenomenon cannot be anything particular mm. so they all come with let's say a relative totality mm. and that needs to be discerned which is the perspective and perhaps we can find out why when that perspective is established how how when there is that totality when one establishes one's mind that way Why there is no room for craving then to interfere mm. how is that why, why is it that when that perspective is lost and you dwell on the particulars that, that by definition means craving which is the suffering mm. well the thing is you wouldn't be able to um, explain like why in a sort of external sense mm -hmm. as if you get out of your experience and then examine how it happens no, no. it's like at any given time you are either absorbed in the particulars or you are established in the right perspective sure so you would get to see that then um again you would need to have faith in in that the buddha is saying 
these things are overcome through perspective mm. not through directly tackling them head on because that's when you get into well you fall from the middle way as the sutta say as the, as the first sutta the Samyutta Nikaya says when you push forward uh, you, you get carried away by the flood mm. when you stand still you sink, you sink. Yeah. so pushing forward means like I'm trying to get rid of this I'm trying to replace it with something else and then standing still is like you just give up everything just I, I don't make any effort I just relax in cho- cho- choiceless awareness or something like that but no it's it is an effort and uh, there is no right mindfulness without right effort because mm. it's that's the, the how the path works but it's not an effort in the sense of changing the content of what you're experiencing it's seeing that general nature that's that sits behind that content and mm-hmm. as you said the body has to be understood in that on that level as well because the body is like that's actually the purpose of uh, breathing for example uh, which is the very first uh, uh, item that comes up in the mindfulness of the body it's it breathing is that general thing that's always there mm-hmm. like regardless of the content of your experience the one thing that you have that you know for sure if you're still alive is that breathing will be there underneath everything else that's happening mm-hmm. so then that unabsorbs you from these particulars of your experience and um and it's actually like precisely the point not to focus on it mm-hmm. because something that's general necessarily is defined by its relation to particulars so if you focus on it you turn it into a new particular yes. so it's not the context anymore and then something else will be the background yeah. to that and and the the point as well is is like perspective um it, it's not even something that you can do every second if it's mm-hmm. really a perspective um it, it's by definition something that you establish it for a moment and then it will endure for who knows how long mm-hmm. so let's say yes uh i was distracted i caught myself acting out of unwholesome states and i remember oh there's an unpleasant feeling here which is sort of that pressure that's directing me to do these things mm-hmm. and then um you establish that and then different thi- different things will start to come up in your mind your mind will start to be thinking about other stuff but you still haven't f- completely forgotten that that unpleasant feeling is there mm. which means that those thoughts that are coming up they are not any more um well founded upon that ignorance so they're not really thoughts of unwholesome nature of trying to act out of that feeling so even though that feeling is there mm. uh you're not acting out of it and to that extent there is purity the, like the other sutta that we yes. that we read like even if you have the hindrances present internally but on the level of thought you're not acting out of them the buddha defines that as purity actually that's, that's right yeah uh, so that's the the principle and then the, the same happens with the with the with the mind with the moods uh, even if you have a mind of passion mind of aversion mind of distraction seeing that and maintaining perspective of that means mm-hmm. For that period of time, as long as that perspective is there, any thought that comes because of the perspective, not mm. because of its content, in and of itself will be wholesome. It will not be um, proliferating mm-hmm. that uh, that uh, those unwholesome states. And then through not feeding them in that way, mm-hmm. not by directly tackling them, as I said, then eventually they will dissipate. So then um, then you will not even have the, the lustful mind or averse mind or whatever. Yeah, so when one maintains perspective in this way, is one automatically not feeding those thoughts? Mm. Or is there something else that needs to happen there? What do you mean? Well, you were just saying, like, when you maintain perspective, then, right, thoughts, their content doesn't matter anymore. Mm. They will be wholesome because you maintain perspective. Mm. I'm just making sure, is that it? Is it just a question of maintaining perspective? Mm. Well... Practically speaking, it is, but I mean, uh, theoretically speaking, it is, but practically, like the mind again will be trying to like scare you or mm-hmm. or um, convince you that no, no, what do I do next or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so I wanted to go into that because that can be come mm-hmm. quickly an obstacle. Yeah, yeah. And this is why you mentioned, I think, earlier that faith comes mm-hmm. even before the mindfulness because um, it's not there's not going to be a tangible result that one is actually, not immediately at, at least, that one is wearing away now 
let's say the causes or the origin of suffering whereas mm. factually one is mm. so that right that's where the faith comes in which is why the understanding is important mm. and perhaps also we should then clear up that faith in the buddhist teaching is based on the right understanding mm. not on hoping that there will be some yeah, result yeah, yeah. Yeah, faith needs to come with with uh, discernment. Like, mm. like you you have faith because to some extent you have seen that these things are beneficial or wholesome. But um, but yeah. So when you are, let's say you, as I said before, you you have an unpleasant feeling enduring, or you have a um, some kind of restless mood mm-hmm. or something like that. And uh, initially, yes, you heard the instruction and you just try to okay. This is the general aspect of my experience is present now. I'm not acting out of it. I leave it there. And then five seconds later, oh, but no, 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 I need to, mm. I need to, I need to, I remember that that sutta said I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to replace this thought with that one and, and whatnot. And then you, um, you had it for a moment and then you fall from it because, mm. because of your own, um, well, you couldn't sustain that perspective. You were captivated by that very thought, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't mm. manage to sustain that perspective even in face of something that was trying to distract you. And that's basically how the hindrances work. Mm. It's like, that's why they say they're weakeners of, of panya, weakeners of wisdom. It's yeah. like they take you away from, from, from the right perspective that mm. you might have had for a moment. So, so it's, it's um, learning to, um, to see that that's really all that matters. What matters is that the, that that perspective is presently established, and then you will you will you will not even it's not possible that you will see yourself the perspective like shrinking as if as if you were looking at another person from the outside. Oh, you basically find that you've lost it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You you realize oh wait I was again acting out of that feeling which means mm-hmm. I forgot it I mm-hmm. forgot the perspective and then you bring it back and then um, what's going to happen is like you keep doing that. And at some point, like it becomes impossible for you to you to even forget the feeling, even even with making no effort to think about it. Yeah, but that will then be the result. So initially, one needs to recognize that one fell from that mm. perspective, and in a sense, the, the 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 recognition that one fell away from it is the reestablishment mm. of it. It's not that something else needs to happen. If that if that understanding was there before, when you realize it's gone, mm. that realization yeah. is the. And, and, and if you still have again the, the the faith to see, no, that's what matters. I'm not gonna give in to the impulse to do more than this and, mm. and start replacing, and and uh, absorbing myself into specifics. Then yes, you bring it back. Um, but practically speaking, it's always gonna be a little bit messier than that. You will be yeah. falling into no no, uh, like rehearsing ideas mm-hmm. to to kind of the right ideas but because now you're again attending them at the expense of the perspective mm-hmm. out of like the need for that intellectual clarity which gives you emotional satisfaction as well mm. you will be forgetting that no no actually what matters is is the the general aspect not this content of the right ideas that mm-hmm. I read from the suttas or something like that um but the reason why I was saying that is because then that's 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 how you get to see when the suttas say um, the the persistent development of the four satipatthanas mm. is the unification of mind is mm. the is samadhi, meaning like when you're so clear about this, let's say nature of the feeling that's enduring in your experience, that you cannot forget it. That's why then you you were free from the five hindrances because all of them were um, they were weakening your perspective but at the same time they themselves were rooted in lack of perspective so it's like a vicious circle mm-hmm. and then when you have that established um, as the Buddha said like whether you whether you sit, stand, walk, lie down basically all that matters is that you keep in mind these phenomena are there as it says in the mm-hmm. Majjhima uh, 19 the two types of thought these mm-hmm. these things are there mm-hmm. and um, that's when it's always in the suttas when it talks about samadhi it says the mind becomes composed or established internally mm-hmm. and that internal aspect is exactly that it's it's these general aspects of your experience because what's external is always the six senses like the objects of the six senses even your thoughts 
Yes. Even if they're the right thoughts and the right reflections, but you're, again, treating them as objects, those things are external. And so when the mind becomes established internally, means it's this underlying basis for everything else, and then the content of your experience doesn't matter anymore because all of it will be in and of itself pure because the perspective is there. Yes, that's the shift. Rather than trying to sort out the contents, which mm. is all impermanent anyway, so that's going to be endless. Mm. This practice is about maintaining perspective upon that. Mm. And that's that's what it's meant with uprooting things. Mm. It's like it's not um, some sort of switch inside of you that you flip and then these things don't arise anymore. Mm. It's you uproot them because it's like it's kind of like um, like a dark like these things can only happen in the dark, unwholesome states. Mm. That's what actually the Buddha compared uh, wisdom with light and yeah. ignorance with darkness. Yes. And these things can only happen when there is darkness. Mm. If there's light, it just can't. Like, yeah, certain things can only grow in the dark. Yeah, yeah. When you switch off the light, they wither away. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what it is. Light, not in the sense of new objects that sort of pop into your experience, which in itself doesn't mean anything because you don't have perspective over that. And mm. you can very much still be having craving towards these new objects. It doesn't matter how special or extraordinary they are. But in this sense, like these things that that are already there, mm -hmm. even in your most ignorant days and when you were fully captivated by, by uh, sense objects and sensuality, the fact remained that the body was the background of your experience. You had a feeling present at that time. Mm -hmm. The mood was there. And there were phenomena there as well. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the, it's the like the Dhamma, the path that the, the Buddha didn't create. Not even internally. Like it's just a path that it was already there. That mm -hmm. freedom was already accessible and possible simply because there are things in your experience that it, don't depend on your choice. Like they're there anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's these four foundations of mindfulness. So, of course... Um, as, as we uh, mentioned in the last few talks as well, there can only be right mindfulness with the right view. So, yes. so you can't just take up these things and just start doing them. But at the same time, you can take it as an exercise in developing right view. Hmm. If you take it as an exercise of, okay, not just how do I do this, that, uh, not just like let me do this, but uh, uh, asking yourself how. Do I, how am I supposed to practice yeah. these Satipatthanas mm -hmm. and, and continuously clarifying and upgrading your conception of that practice, then that can be a way to approach the right view, which is understanding the, the noble eightfold path. Yeah, so by making an effort to understand what these four Satipatthana are and how they will bring about the destruction of craving, mm -hmm. one might actually come to see for oneself you would see the four noble truths. You yeah, would see the exactly. cessation of craving as a result of that. Yes. Um, so, so it's that's why it's useful. But mm. it's it's that shift in attitude, where most of us, when we hear about Buddhism, it's just like, okay, I heard this instruction. Now let me do this. Mm. But you never question yourself as to the fact that, even though, like, no matter how good the instruction from the person is, you yourself will have assumptions mm. regarding how to practice this. Which will make it wrong for you, because of the because of the attitude that like it's introducing craving where there shouldn't be, and mm -hmm. so on. So if you don't make an effort to to um, rectify that first, and you just start doing it with however with, with whichever uh, attitudes you had from the start, then it's not going to lead to what it was supposed to be. Yeah. So you cannot be just take a pragmatist approach and from the beginning just you know put some muscle on it and mm. and do it. That's going to be too mm. easy. Yeah, and, and it's not even what like what works for you at the moment because as the Buddha said it's it's like what will naturally happen if you just emphasize what makes me more calm, what makes me more peaceful, it's just gonna be the way it makes you feel. So it was mm. just gonna be an endeavor of how do I never feel displeasure. And as the Buddha said, um, there's this pleasure there's pleasure that should be cultivated, pleasure that should not be cultivated. Displeasure that should be cultivated, mm -hmm. displeasure that shouldn't be cultivated. So in other words, it's not that all displeasure you immediately get rid of. Mm -hmm. But if you take, like you said, a pragmatist approach, what that's going to result in is it's just like, how do I not feel displeasure ever? Yeah. 
which means that you're already reacting to feeling basically yeah so and and you're not establishing that background mm -hmm. of like no no it's not like what i feel mm -hmm. which is content it's mm -hmm. the fact that i know feeling as the background of all of mm -hmm. my actions which prevents those actions from being rooted in craving yeah perhaps you can speak a bit more about understanding these backgrounds mm. rightly which is just synonymous with context and perspective mm. that now occurs to me there's this one discourse where Sariputta was talking about this and he says I just decide in the morning to put on a coat or a jacket and then in the in the midday I put on another coat and then in the evening I can put on yet another jacket or another coat and that was a simile for how he was practicing these establishments of, mm. of, of mindfulness mm. so he just decides to dwell in one of these satipatthana and I think that simile is quite accurate. Like a coat is something wider, right? It, it, it's, mm. it's something that sort of envelops you and that you find yourself within. Mm. And, uh, and, he, and you can put on different coats, right? right? So you have, now you have body, feeling, mind, phenomena. There are like four different backgrounds, but you do need to sort of have the intention, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to stick with this mm. one now and establish that as a perspective. Mm. And then it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter which of the four, if you do it right, Mm. because it's the principle that that, yeah, that yeah, matters yeah. the principle being the pre that they all offer a perspective upon the content which is present mm. and they cannot be independent of that right the, the the background is not independent of the content which is present mm. but dwelling on that background knowledge is the perspective that then prevents the craving from further proliferating it's the principle of concurrency as was said before yeah and that's why then yes the four satipatthanas are the kind of most um you could say standard or formulaic description of right mindfulness but the suttas are full of other ways hmm. like um the brahma viharas you have the um uh perception of dispassion perception of non-delight mm -hmm. um it says like the per perspective perspective of dissatisfaction with food mm -hmm. um you have these um perceptions of the forest uh, -huh. uh sometimes it would even say um like oh you just contemplate the root of a tree you expand your mind using the perception of the root of a tree mm. see that's also wider then from the root of a tree you expand it to uh the forest mm -hmm. then from the forest you expand it to the village from mm -hmm. the village you expand it to the country and all of these are essentially the same thing it's just contextualizing yeah whatever is happening in your mind with that broader thing that's already there it doesn't depend on you maintaining it no and that's actually why it's 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 peaceful because that perspective then it's not like i'm doing this no every moment you are recollecting that you're ceasing that, to ignore it that there's always a possibility of establishing a yeah. step back quote unquote which is this context which which is what puts the perspective upon what's yeah. happening right now yeah. Yeah. sheds light on it mm. without you needing to to put it there mm -hmm. it's something that was already there you just recognize it so that's the principle if, if it feels like I'm, I'm just doing this and maintaining this that's not the right the right way even if the idea about it is right but it means you're not seeing it really as something that's in your experience mm -hmm. you're sort of fabricating it yeah so you're not fabricating it but the effort has to be in recollecting yeah, that right. it is already there mm -hmm. yeah. so perhaps we can discuss now um, some let's say um, ways that will help to not fall away from this which practically speaking will mean like how is one going to recollect this, mm. right? So we have cleared up to, to some degree this concurrency and the perspective, but one will be falling away from it. Mm. So how to practically not fall away from that? Well, that's the first thing. Yeah. Keep your virtue. Mm don't act out in the like super coarse obvious ways also don't act out in the less obvious ways either mm -hmm. and then how do you come after that also don't out, act out of the question all right what now <laughs> well i would say that 
and one will like fall out for this middle way like many times like mm-hmm. many many times and at some point he might feel like oh I'm not going to follow anymore mm-hmm. and then I can relax but that is already falling yeah, apart yeah. so That's instead of trying to like how to put that I think it's like like the Buddha used an image like it's like the kind of the, the guy who guard the car he's kind of fitting them to not go into the crops yeah. and as long when they don't go into the crops he's don't like just lie down and fall asleep mm. he's like he lay down he can relax but he keep an eyes on them mm. he keep at, like he still like can kind of to some degree relax but he still have to have in mind that mm. as long as he's not free from the liability from these things to happen that can still to some degree happen yeah, so yeah. I'm still sitting there watching my cow and but it's still much more peaceful than, mm. peaceful than yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. So being vigilant, I will say, is mm. kind of the one one that kind of managed to understand like this kind of recollection of this kind of direction between content and context is to kind of every time he fall to come back, but when he's not falling back, to still watching it. Yeah, <laughs> because because if you understood it rightly, you would realize that it's again these things are already in your experience. So if it feels like being vigilant or, or maintaining it is is like painful or 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 like is a burden, then you you haven't understood it properly because it's like actually your your act of forgetting about these things comes second to these things already being there. Mm. Mm. So so in that sense, it's it's um, even your forgetting is kind of like irrelevant because it's it's fundamentally still there. Irrelevant yeah. in the sense that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah of they course need to qualify that yeah, yeah of course doesn't mean like you're you're justified in forgetting mm. but what it means is like if you emphasize again the aspect of no no it's only there when I am thinking about it mm. then even if you're thinking about it it won't be on the right level mm. so you need to basically uh, see like yes if I even if I were to completely forget it, it would still be there. Mm. But doesn't mean that you allow yourself to forget. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're already enlightened. Yeah, exactly. Just, yes, yes. Yeah, that's another mm-hmm. way. Yeah, now there's this other sutta which occurs to me. Like um, there's a simile where somebody walks around with a bowl of water mm. on his head, which is like filled to the brim, and uh, there's a big market square, and uh, there's a lot of people there, and there are some enticing women to performing some show. And then there's somebody walking behind you with a raised sword. And if there's only one drop of water that spills from that bowl, then that assassin will mm. just chop your head off on the spot. And and so this bowl being full of water, right, can be interpreted as like, you know, you, you want to keep your mindfulness and not lose mm. it even for one drop. But that assassin is again behind you, mm. right? So So mindfulness of death in that sense is, is, is also a context that you can establish. Mm. Um, so that's also something that you find yourself within, which, which when the simile is rightly understood, can, is, is basically on that same level. Mm. It, it's not that you're creating your own death. You can die because you're always already liable to it. Yeah, and, and also, as I said, those are not mindful or as of death, in the sense that anything that comes then, it's like, it's, it's, um, it's like, a, like a floodgate that's open. Mm. So then anything that comes in is going to overwhelm you, including most importantly death. Yeah. So it's um it's uh it's but see, it is something that because it doesn't depend on the content of your experience, it is actually realistic to live with that attitude. Um of, of like I, I must not forget this even for a moment. Whereas if it if it were about focusing you you kind of can't mm-hmm. do that because it's it's you you won't be able to have this object like first of all sit with your eyes closed Mm -hmm. every moment which is most of the time required in order to focus on something Mm -hmm. um but if it's this context that stands below everything you have no justification for losing it because you don't need more stable actually in its nature yeah yeah. compared to that other direction Yeah, yeah and you don't need to you don't need to forget about what you're feeling in order to do physical work, you don't need to forget about what you're feeling in order to talk. You don't mm. need to forget about what you're feeling in order to do anything. Mm-hmm. So there isn't a justification for ever losing that context. And you yeah. can actually then live in that way of, of perfect vigilance. And um, yeah, it's it's 
the the other thing I wanted to clear up regarding that simile is is uh, in the context of the like the practice. Let's say when you actually sit down. And dedicate yourself to these reflections, as this would say, in seclusion, of course, in an empty hut, mm. in a, in a in a forest or something. Um, you then have to not take the simile liter- literally in the sense of, okay, let me now have this particular thought mm-hmm. of these satipatthanas present every second, because otherwise my head will be cut off. It's that perspective. So yes, you have to think about it for a moment because mm-hmm. it's not like it's going to be magically there but on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to think about it, bring it to your mind, attend to it, let's say. Yeah. And then if you saw it properly, because it is actually already there in your experience, yes. sort of the memory becomes like embedded into mm-hmm. uh, your experience then and then. And then your your goal is now, okay, how do I not lose the perspective Instead of, how do I just keep this thought about the perspective every second? Yeah, because then you're controlling again. Yeah, which yeah. is which is maintenance. And it's gonna lose. Like if you if you are doing it that way, that kind of already implies that you didn't see the perspective to begin with. Because yeah. it would become obvious that that's not where it is. It's not in me thinking about the feeling. Like the feeling is not in me every second attending to the feeling. Mm-hmm. The feeling is. The foundation for my experience and mm-hmm. i just need to recognize it yeah. so then in that sense mindfulness once established has to become independent of your doing mm-hmm. until it goes away and then you bring it back and then it goes away again and then you yeah. bring it back and so on now how does it go away because understanding how it goes mm-hmm. away might practically prevent it from going away well what yeah you could say what's the measure for it going away yeah because if it doesn't depend on on you thinking about it then how would do we define when the mindfulness went away mm. yeah that's exactly the question mm. yes Because sometimes it can go away for like it could be weeks, mm. even just like losing perspective and just kind of like. Well, relatively speaking, like the more subtle aspects you might have lost, but that's the good news. Like if you're established in virtue, mm. some degree of perspective will never leave you. Mm. That's the that's the thing. So yeah, the more subtle things that you're still sort of trying to understand, you might lose those for a while, but the the. Like mind, virtue is already a form of, of mindfulness mm-hmm. in that sense because not doing those things in and of itself involves greater perspective mm-hmm. but then yeah so actually we could take the, the example of virtue when do you um, lose the mindfulness of virtue let's say is it when like you you just forget that you, that you stop repeating the mantra of the precepts in your mind mm. no it's not no yeah yeah exactly so when you find yourself acting out mentally intentionally out of greed aversion or delusion uh like let's say five hindrances mm-hmm. that's when you know indirectly pretty yeah. much you know yeah. indirectly sort of by inference oh the context went away mm. now it's time to bring it back but for a while you will have that there and yes you will have like the the attempts of the hindrances let's say but for as long as that light of the context is there they won't be able to find footing mm-hmm. but at some point it will happen that you lost it and they will come back and then you know oh i had to switch on the light again yeah and um so we, we lose them by we lose this per- perspective by not directly but like by engaging mm-hmm. in certain things that require us forget about it yeah yeah you will fi- you will find yourself in like a, a some establishment of perspective and then something will come that feels like it's justified might even be like an idea about oh let me clarify this idea of dhamma now like i know that this is the practice right here this perspective i know that this is actually the dhamma hmm. but my mind convinces me like no no it's these um you know abstract 
mm. scholarly connections mm. that I need to make between also how does the third Satipatthana relate to the you know the the right livelihood or something <laughs> yeah but, but you see but yeah but why is that problematic because in order to make those connections or comparisons you, you are descend into the content again I would, that's exactly what i would yeah, say yeah. in those words like you so you there cannot be a comparison between backgrounds and foregrounds mm. from that point of view like they, they they depend on one another but the comparison that we are talking about that makes you fall away from the establishment will always be that way and then start making comparisons yeah. there yeah. so that so you so you want to go from that horizontal view over there mm. to re-establish a perspective which is that way basically mm. um, so to get into the habit of these of, of well to to get into the habit of recognizing this tendency to compare mm. is useful because when you recognize that it can help to re-establish mm. that perspective yeah you 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 when you're established in it you kind of have a sense if you're self-honest mm. you have a sense of what will take you away and what will not take you away yeah and um and uh, the last thing i wanted to mention is that's why it's uh, the the virtue is necessary beforehand because even though you might have as the suttas would say like a finger snap mm -hmm. of the right right perspective realistically speaking if you're not established in the virtue all these other things that will sort of distract you from it will be so um, convincing for you like you, you you're just not used to not being trapped by those baits that realistically speaking that perspective is going to last very little and then even if you're repeating the same ideas and the same concepts mm -hmm. you don't see the difference because again you 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 will be approaching it through the angle of ideas or the same concept of mm -hmm. okay establishing the context but it's not in the right level now because yeah so the idea of the context mm. doesn't necessarily mean that you are now attending with the right context mm. to the idea of the context yeah yeah so virtue and sensory training and all these things they just get you used to even if you're not explicitly thinking about it that way mm. they get they make you get used to not operating as much mm -hmm. on the level of content anymore yeah and that basically like that's the most direct way that you can guarantee that when you try to practice these these recollections that you won't go in the wrong direction mm. of uh, clarifying ideas.